Hello, everybody. Um, this is the Standing Committee on Health and Social Development. Uh, it's Wednesday, February 9th. Uh, I'm your chair. Uh, my name is Gordon McNeely. And um, just uh, joining us today are uh, uh, members uh, uh, Michelle Beaton. I can't remember if it's Trisha or Carla is the permanent member. Carla. Carla, Carla Bernard. Um, Zach Bell. Sydney McEwen, uh, Rob Henderson, and Trish Altez is joining us along with Ola Hammerland. So um, just saying that, can I get a motion to adopt the agenda? So uh, Rob Henderson. And just before we get started, I just want to like send a special shout out to everybody's working hard this month. Uh, um, with uh, This month is uh, Black History Month in Prince Edward Island and there's a lot of great activities going on. and. And that falls within the purview of this committee. So, um, wishing them very well. So, um, saying that, we're going to move on to uh, today. We're going to get a briefing from uh, Hockey PEI on the incident of racism in sport. And uh, we have the executive director, uh, Connor Cameron, with us, uh, who's going to take us through a presentation. And then we'll hold uh, questions uh, for the end. So, um, I'm seeing here that your microphone might be muted at this time, Connor. Uh, oh, there you go. So um, what I'll do is I'll pass the floor over to you and thank you for joining us this afternoon and, uh, and you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. I'm um, just gonna share my screen and start my um, PowerPoint presentation here. Just give me one second. Everyone can see okay? Perfect. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna start off today with giving a bit of a, an overview um, to the committee in terms of what our organization is and does on a daily basis. Um, we will then hold for questions at the end. Um, feel free if at any point um, through this presentation, if I skim over a detail that may seem obvious to someone like myself that's been inside hockey for most of my life. If, if it seems um, like I'm skimming over something, please stop. I, I deal with a lot of this stuff on a daily basis. So um, some of it I, I can tend to skim over at times. So if there's any questions uh, part way through the presentation, please feel free to stop me. And um, the second thing I will say is there's probably some spelling mistakes in the presentation. I apologize for that. Um, had didn't quite have the time to edit it that um, I would normally like to have and uh, my mother is going to be very disappointed if she sees this so um, I'll, I'll start now and I apologize for any spelling or grammar mistakes. Um, so Hockey PEI, uh, since 1975 Hockey PEI has been the, the administration lead for amateur hockey on PEI. Um, our mission statement is drive to develop, passionate, participate in inspiring um, for life. Um, I think it's very important to, to kind of go over the overview of Hockey PEI and what Hockey PEI is. A lot of times um, the community perception or the public perception of Hockey PEI is that Hockey PEI is an individual or a group of individuals. Um, the reality is, is that Hockey PEI is built on the back of volunteers. Um, we have tons of, of really good volunteers here. Um, and I'm just going to take a minute to kind of go over and highlight um, some of the different volunteers and different um, areas at which they volunteer for our organization. So here at Hockey PEI, we're the governing body for organized hockey in the province of Prince Edward Island, where the main purpose is to foster, promote, develop, supervise, regulate, and govern the sport of amateur hockey. We encourage competition at both a competitive level and a recreation level for those who enjoy hockey for the sportsmanship, sportsmanship excuse me, skill and enjoyment it can provide. Since 1975, Hockey PEI has operated on a, under a council system whereby all members have a voice in the operation of the provincial body through the respective council. Hockey PEI is structured with six councils. Minor Hockey Council, um, that's typically the council that deals with the day-to-day -day operations of minor hockey. Um, think scheduling of leagues, think um, organization with the minor hockey associations. Um, senior Hockey Council and Junior Hockey Council are combined into one, um, one chair. Um, currently, um, we have a Development Council. Um, development Council takes care of 
all grassroots programming. Um, that's just not, not just a triple a, um, thing that's, that's a grassroots, um, from recreation all the way up to competitive. Um, we have female hockey council. Um, they deal with the day-to-day -day operations, um, as well as the, um, potential to grow the female game here on PEI. Um, and we have the official councils, which, um, that council handles the, the officials. So, uh, not just scheduling of the officials, but the education, uh, the recertification of all officials on PEI. Hockey PEI is a member of Hockey Canada. So we are the provincial sports organization. Our national sports organization is Hockey Canada. And we, Hockey PEI, take an active role in helping to set the national policies. There's 13 members for Hockey uh, Canada. Hockey PEI is one of those members. Uh, with a membership of approximately 8,000, Hockey PEI is represent of hockey skill development programs, the promotion and fund management of teams and leagues, regularly competing, establishing uniform playing rules, and to regulate the registration and certification of players, referees, and team officials. Hockey PEI has the representation of amateur hockey throughout the province, serves a uni as a unified voice in dealing with government, governments and private agencies in promoting the cause of hockey. That's a big reason why I think we're here today. Um, so our structure, so we kind of just talked about our councils. Um, we're now gonna talk a little bit about our structures. Um, our structures first and foremost start with our 20 minor hockey associations. Um, those associations stretch all the way from uh, Tignish to Surrey um, and there's 20 of them. Uh, we have two major U18 male teams that participate in the New Brunswick PEI U18 Hockey League. Um, we're also, in the process of exploring the possibility of having two female U18 major teams at the moment. Um, we operate a junior B Island League. We operate a junior C League on PEI. Um, we have one junior A team that's part of the, the MHL or the Maritime Hockey League. That's the Summerside Capitals. Um, we have two U sport teams over at the university. Uh, both the Panthers fall under our umbrella. Um, we have one major junior team, the Charlottetown Islanders. They have their own rules and regulations under their government, but they do fall under us um, for AP players, promotional, um, and also insurance needs. Um, we also operate various rec leagues. And outside of the last two years due to COVID, we typically operate a senior league in the western end of the island as well. Up next is kind of the org chart for Hockey PEI. So Hockey PEI is run by a board of directors. Um, the board of directors come from the chairs of each council. So it, it, there's an executive management group um, of Hockey PEI that consists of the president, the executive VP of finance, the executive VP, and the past president. So that's the four-person brain trust, if you will, uh, of Hockey PEI's board. Um, they're able to make decisions on employees, um, things of that nature. Um, the board, which is made up the, of the executive manager group, along with the chair of each council, which is below it, that makes up the board of directors for Hockey PEI. So any issue that needs to be voted on, those are the eight, eight to nine people that would sit in, in judgment of the vote. Um, our president has a vote only in, in the case of a tie. Um, so the president of Hockey PEI often operates as for lack of better terms, a bit of a political uh, figure where um, he's often trying to uh, work favors with the board and, and such. Does anybody have any questions on the structure of the board before we move? I feel like that's a very important um, piece and I don't wanna skim over that if, if there's confusion. Uh, yeah, there is a question, uh, Connor. Uh, Rob Henderson. Just to ask, so how are people uh, selected to be on that committee? Are they elected? Does uh, uh, each council send a person to the committee, or uh, how, how does that uh, sort of work? Yeah, so they're all elected positions. Um, the council positions, typically speaking, um, people serve on the council and then are voted into chair. Um, but the actual mechanics of our constitution allows for people to be elected in all those positions. And there's no prerequisite of time served or if they've been with the organization before. So to answer your question, yes, they're, they're all voted on um, and elected. And that takes place through um, Hockey PEI's main AGM, which is in June. Um, but these councils each also host their own AGM, which is typically, again, outside of COVID, but it's, it's typically a month or so before. So it's usually early May, middle of May. Um, our constitution has 
uh, regulations and bylaws where we have to advertise for such positions um, 40 to five days in advance, I believe. Um, so yes, they, they are elected positions that come up. Um, the positions are also for one year. The way it reads in the constitution is it's, it's a maximum of three years, but each term is a one, one year term. So you can serve three consecutive one year terms for a three year total before you need to move positions. Um, but that's voted on and passed every year. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. Perfect. Um, I just have a quick question. How many people sit on the appeals committee and how many people sit on the discipline and ethics committee and are those positions currently occupied? Sorry, Mr. McNeil, I didn't catch the end of your sentence. Are they oh. currently occupied? Yeah, the, the appeals uh, committee and the discipline and ethics committee, are those, mm -hmm. uh, how many people on those and uh, can you, talk about the, the current makeup of those um so the maximum of five minimum of three so quorum for both of those councils are three our appeals committee is set up um we had we've activated a new discipline and ethics committee in the last number of weeks um that committee is currently sitting on the mark connor's case um it's not fair for me to say if they will continue on in the dne process i think there are people from outside our organization that we've kind of reached out to some of them are out from outside our organization, so we've extended the offer for them to, to continue on in those positions, um, but they haven't guaranteed that yet. I think there's a bit of a feeling out process on their end of things in terms of what we're doing and how we're doing, um, and we've been uh, trying to be respectful of that, of that process. So to answer your question, the appeals committee, yeah, it's full. It, it has three people who sit on it year round. They've already heard two appeal scenarios this year. Um, that's a third party committee appointed by the president every fall. They operate at arm's length of hockey PEI. They have no connection to hockey PEI. Um, and the discipline and ethics committee operates a lot in the same way. Um, discipline and ethics has a little bit more of a direct connection to myself as the executive director because they require a little bit more administration assistance in terms of setting up Zooms, collecting emails, um, those type of day-to-day -day functions. And I, I often serve that purpose for that committee. Um, but that's just an admin position. There's no decision-making power from hockey PEI on that committee. Great. Thank you very much. Anything else? I'll jump to the next slide. So we have four staff here at hockey PEI. We have myself as the executive director. I'm responsible for the day-to-day um, tasks or wishes of the board of directors of hockey PEI. Um, I help to promote the policies. I help, I help to implement the decisions that are made at the board level. Um, the second position we have is a technical director. That's Chris McPhee. Chris is responsible for high performance program, um, as well as all of the development um, that falls under hockey PEI. Again, that, that includes grass level. Uh, that, that includes a level. I often think that Sometimes people hear development and they automatically think AAA. Um, that's not the case. We do development for, for all ages, all age categories to make sure everybody can uh, enjoy and have fun. Our third position is as a manager of hockey operations and communications, that's Tanner Duran. Tanner also runs our social media. Um, he's a recent graduate of UPI, graduated last May, um, and has been an extraordinary help to our staff. Um, and the fourth position is Michelle Durash, who's an office administrator for us. Um, so we have four staff on, on a daily basis. Our volunteers are much larger than four. Um, our, our, our whole organization, our whole operation is built on the back of, of good volunteers. Um, we're proud of its member-based organization. We have approximately over 2,000 volunteers who work hard to make hockey possible across our island. Um, I think when you think 2000, it seems like a large number, but once you kind of section out some of these areas, um, it becomes more clear. So each one of those 20 associations, um, all 20 associations have a board as well. Um, all those boards are volunteer. All the coaches in the minor hockey system are volunteer. All managers are volunteer. All team trainers are volunteer. Um, so everyone at the minor hockey level um, outside of, I believe there are administration positions in two minor hockey associations that are partially funded, um, not full-time positions, but they do um, pay a little bit of money in the fall time through registration when demand is the highest. Um, but outside of those two kind of quasi positions, everything else is volunteer. 
Um, Hockey BI's board of directors is absolutely volunteer position with an honorarium for each position. Um, our committee members are volunteer, our council members are volunteer, our high performance coaches and staffs are all volunteer as well. Um, our manager of officiating who handles all of the officials education is also volunteer and our suspension coordinator who hands out the daily suspensions um, is also a volunteer. It's probably important to highlight that the suspension coordinator does not have decision-making power. That's an administration function. So um, he would issue, uh, when we are playing games, uh, he would wake up every day, uh, check the back end of the electronic game system that we have, see if there's any penalties that require an automatic suspension. If there is, um, he would then uh, issue that automatic suspension. So for example, if you get kicked out in the last five minutes for hitting from behind, it's a major penalty. That's an automatic two games because it's the last 10 minutes. If there's nothing to be decided, um, that's where the suspension coordinator would, would issue the suspension. Any suspension that's indefinite or requires an investigation goes to the discipline and ethics committee. Just want to be clear on that one. So when we look at our volunteers, um, I think we then look at kind of the policies that um, Hockey PEI houses um, and, and enforces on a daily basis. A lot of these volunteers, uh, excuse me, a lot of these policies have grown and changed um, with society over the years. Um, and those policies include uh, abuse and harassment policy, an alcohol policy, certification requirements, championship policy, code of conduct with a complaint intake form attached, a dressing, a dressing room policy, excuse me, a, a hazing policy, a, locking, a locker boxing dressing room video violence policy. Um, I'm sure you all remember um, there was a time when uh, ro locker room boxing was at the very forefront. Uh, it was at the end of my modern hockey career, but that, that one has a policy. Um, also a new policy, uh, three years old on electronic devices in facilities, um, social media policy, video review policy, and a volunteer screening policy. Actually, before I move on to the new maltreatment rule 11, is there any questions on those policies uh, before I move on? The, the maltreatment rule 11 is the overall, um, not only playing rule, but policy from Hockey Canada that deals with maltreatment within the game of hockey. Um, I think for the purpose of today's call, that that's gonna be the crux of our discussion. Um, but I just wanna make sure that there are no other questions on any of the other policies before we on them. We're also going to touch on the code of conduct a little bit later on because I feel it's rev relevant to this conversation. Just one question, is the code of conduct where you'd find uh, the policies for uh, anything uh, racial or cultural? Uh, yes, also rule 11. So there, there's two policies and I have slides on those later on um, and, and we, can, we can build those out and have a bit of a deeper discussion. Um, the code of conducts listed here with the complaint intake form, I'm going to run over that in a minute, um, to the point where, uh, you'll be able to see quite clearly when a complaint comes in, where it goes to, how it's fed, um, who touches it, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the rule 11 is the new rule within the game of hockey that deals with maltreatment. So those two are going to be expanded on later on in the slide show. So it, I, I would just suggest if you have some questions on the other one, other two or, or other policies, um, maybe this would be a good time. And if not, maybe just hold up on, on the other two until we finish the code of conduct and maltreatment piece. Um, yeah, we, we, Michelle Beaton, I'll give you a second. Are you ready for your question? Yes, thanks, Chair. Hi, Connor, and thanks for being with us. Um, Connor, uh, your social media policy was um, the basis of some um, a lot of media lately. So if you're not reviewing that later, can you talk to talk us through the social media policy and any changes that you might see required in order for to update that? Yeah, that's a tough one, Michelle. Um, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, what I can say about the social media policy is we've reached out to people in the community that we feel is qualified not only from a policy standpoint, but also from a, a life standpoint an experience standpoint. So the social media policy is very much under review at this point. Um, social media policies in general, I'm not sure how up to date the committee is on kind of the North American landscape on the social media policies, but it's very much a hot button topic. 
Um, that social media policy, and we'll probably touch on it later, but that social media policy is is exactly kind of what Hockey PEI has declared publicly in terms of those are the type of things where we're going to reach out to people in the community to find out what we need to do to tweak those. What I can say about the social media policy is that it was built, um, I think, 2012 or 2014. I'd have to look it up. It's one of those two years. But I think if you talk to the people who were around the table when it was developed, it was developed at a time when social media was in its infancy. Um, I, I think organizations, uh, hockey organizations, saw things happening like um, organizing fights before games, um, trash talking after games and stuff like that. So I, I think that was the genesis of the policy. I think in 2022, um, that policy needs to be looked at because it can be applied um, like it was um, in the middle of December. It can be implied in a way that looks or appears to be uh, discriminatory in nature. So that's one policy that we're going to definitely look at um, going forward. Okay. Thanks, Chair. I appreciate that. Thanks for clarifying, Connor. Thank you. Mr. Chair, are you good if I continue on to the next slide? Yeah, absolutely. I just thought I'd just give a little pause to indicate that, but yes. Great. Go ahead, Connor. Sure. So maltreatment. Um, starting this year in hockey, uh, there's new, a new rule. It's called Rule 11. Um, it's a maltreatment and discrimination um, rule. This rule has a number of sections uh, to it. Um, there's a slide coming up on, on that next. Um, but the spirit of the rule, um, the idea of adding in this new Rule 11 to the rule book is that um, it gives the teeth to officials. Um, if anyone hears uh, a, a case of maltreatment, um, obviously racism is... Uh, at the forefront of, of maltreatment. Um, so please don't, uh, you know, take my, my words of maltreatment as, as more important than racism. I think there's a lot of issues within the game of hockey that maltreatment can possibly address in the future. Um, hockey Canada's stance on this was, was they wanted to be committed um, to contributing to the physical, psychological, social, and spiritual health of individuals on, of varying abilities, backgrounds, and interests. Hockey Canada and its members firmly believe that only <clears throat> that only when sport environments are safe and inclusive can these values be realized. Maltreatment includes violent acts that result in harm or in the potential of physical or psychological harm. Maltreatment in all of its forms is a serious issue that undermines the health, well-being, performance, and security of everyone associated with the game of hockey. And it's incompatible that'll be the core values that lie at the heart of the Canadian sport participants in hockey Canada's programming should have the reasonable expectation. It will be in an environment that is accessible, inclusive and free from all, all forms of maltreatment. Um, that was the genesis of the rule 11 and why it came in through hockey Canada um, and its members hockey PEI being one of them um, was the driving force uh, to implement that rule. Um, team officials shall always be responsible for their conduct and that of their players. <clears throat> they must endeavor to prevent disorderly conduct before, during, and after the game on or off the ice in any place in the rink. A referee may assess a penalty to any team official failure to do so and shall report the individuals by completing the game incident report, including full details and submitting the report to the appropriate member or league delegate. I think it's important to also flag at this point that our game sheets. So when you think, when you think of reporting and you think of game sheets and you think of penalties um, up until this year, that was all done on paper. So you think of the young uh, person sitting in the penalty box, uh, filling out a form. We've gone electronic now. Um, the reason for that is that the compiling of these incidents um, the speed at which we can then get reports, you know, directly from the referees um, to our email inboxes is basically instantaneous. So when, when a game is completed, um, an iPad is delivered to the referees. The referees then give a voice report of what happened, if there's a penalty, if there's not a penalty, and they follow those proceedings. Um, but that's all done electronic. Um, and we receive that, that information um, as soon as it's uploaded um, to the website. What is maltreatment? Um, 
maltreatment is is consists of any acts that result in actual or potential of physical or psychological harm. This is included but not limited to physical, psychological, sexual actions as detailed below. I don't think we really need to jump into the detail of the physical, psychological, and sexual. Um, but I will say that um, I, I do think all three of those things happen in society. And the fact they happen in society, I think it would probably be um, unwise to think they don't happen within the game of hockey. Hockey Canada believes that every person should have a positive experience in hockey. It's easy to say that discrimination, harassment, abuse have no place in our game, but we all play a role in making that a reality. We must all expect more from our participants, our teammates, and ourselves. No excuses. So the new playing rule, um, as I mentioned, it, it, it has five um, sections to it. I just want to take one second here just to explain this. So this is a rule with inside the game of hockey. Maltreatment rule 11, like, like every other rule, kind of has varying degrees. 11.1 um, .1 is an unsportsmanlike conduct. Um, when you think of maltreatment within the game of hockey, um, you know, racism is certainly at the forefront of that, um, no question. Uh, homophobia is also at the forefront of that, no question. Um, but you certainly um, also see... Um, you know, not great relationships between players and coaches, not great relationships between parents and players, um, not great relationships between parents and officials sometimes. Um, so that that's the type of stuff that would fall under the 11.1. 11.2, disrespectful abuse and harassing behavior. That's more along the lines of uh, a coach who has been told by the referee to calm down and continues on with the argument. So it's kind of just an accelerated additional penalty that can be issued. Uh, spitting is its own uh, penalty with, with severe um, penalties. Um, and then above that is discrimination. Um, the discrimination one, which I'll touch on again, kind of has two aspects to it. If it's called in the game, so if someone actually gets a penalty, um, if someone's heard by the official during the game uh, saying a, a derogatory slur or anything along those lines, they will get a penalty, 11.4. It'll automatically go into the game sheet. Um, the referee will do a follow-up um voice recording that will be received by us our suspension coordinator will check his emails uh, before work the next day and automatically an indefinite suspension pending a hearing and an investigation by the dne committee will be initiated so that player will be automatically removed from hockey immediately 11.5 uh, is physical harassment of officials so now i'm going to touch on the complaint intake form. Um, and I'm just going to skip ahead of a slide or two here. Um, so this is the process for the complaint intake form. So I kind of covered off the rule 11 maltreatment rule within the game. Um, so that kind of handles any complaint that will be heard by an official recorded by an official. Um, we also have an additional process, which is just a an open form uh, code of conduct complaint intake form um, and it can be filed and submitted to hockey PEI uh, at any time by anyone. Um, that process as you can kind of see on the slide here um, basically what happens in the initial process whether it's filed with an MHA um, or myself um, and, and it's also important to pause here um, typically speaking um, the volume of, of requests that we will receive on a, on a complaint intake form, a lot of times we get complaints about ice time. A lot of times we get complaints about an unfair coach. So when you see these things where it's sectioned off to MHA or the MHA receives the complaint, we're not talking about maltreatment in those scenarios. What we're talking about is the day-to-day -day minutia of minor hockey. So if two coaches don't get along at Association B, well, maybe that's filed with hockey PEI, but it's sent back to the minor hockey as a minor infraction. No maltreatment cases is ever labeled as minor infraction. So it's automatically deemed a major infraction. And then, and then it goes to the discipline and ethics committee, um, which I explained um, earlier. So I think that's kind of an important 
important pin to put in put into this is no no um, maltreatment infraction is ever deemed anything other than major and, and hockey PEI deals with the major um, infractions this complaint intake form can be filled out by anyone doesn't have to be a member of ours doesn't have to be it can, can be filled out by anyone and submitted to us the difference between the complaint intake form and the incident reports um, the big difference is the complaint intake form is that um, the referees weren't made aware of it, uh, didn't hear it, or might have missed it. Um, it. It's a bit more of a wide um, net that we cast that people can submit these complaints. The incident reports are, are quite stiff and narrow. Um, they have a they have a, a rule in the rule book um, that has a criteria. Um, that needs to be reported. I think our officials have done a really good job of, of reporting these allegations this year. Um, and certainly whenever they've heard any, any type of issue, um, they, they're always really good to let us know and to report that right away. Um, so here's the point uh, uh, where we're gonna speak about the Discipline and Ethics Committee. So every fall, um, Every August at our August board meeting, the president appoints a chairperson of the Discipline and Ethics Committee, which, which can consist of a minimum of three. So we have a quorum of three and a maximum of five individuals. That includes the chairperson. The Discipline and Ethics Committee has the power to find, suspend, or expel any hockey PEI member. Um, the Discipline and Ethics Committee make independent decisions. I think that's also important to highlight. The Discipline and Ethics Committee may deal with any matter which it deems necessary for the benefit of the welfare of hockey, and in particular may deal with unsportsmanlike conduct on and off the ice in any area where the game of hockey is being played, or at any meeting or gathering in the interest of the game, or arising from the infringement of the rules of the game, or the rules of hockey PEI. Discipline and Ethics Committee Chair or designate shall will all match penalties or physical or verbal abuse of an official assessed pursuant to Hockey Canada's playing rules. Upon the review, the discipline hearing may be held in accordance with Bylaw 21. Um, Bylaw 21 just outlines the power and authority of the Discipline and Ethics Committee. Any decision of the Discipline and Ethics Committee may be appealed to the Appeals Committee of Hockey PEI, and it also may be appealed to the Appeals Committee of Hockey Canada. I, I just have a question on that, if I could. What happens when you don't have a Discipline and Ethics Committee? I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, d d is there, there's, there's not one currently serving, is that correct? Uh, yeah, there's currently one serving. They're, they're currently sitting on the Merrick Connors case. But is that, is that an ad hoc committee? Well, it's a discipline and ethics committee, so it's appointed by the president. Um, as I mentioned in the opening, we've invited those people to stay on and they haven't committed to us on whether they will or not. Um, they're still working on the written decision for Mark Connor. So um, our president has the power within our constitution to appoint any committee at any time. He can strike an ad hoc committee, he can strike discipline and ethics committee. So um, those people have been extended invites to stay on board. We just haven't heard back in, on if they wish to do so. Okay. Great, thank you, Connor. That's pretty much the end of my deal. Um, probably an appropriate time for any questions. Yeah, we'll open up the floor to uh, members at this time. So uh, we'll start with uh, Zach Bell. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Connor, um, for uh, presenting this today. It's, it's funny being uh, someone who's involved with hockey pretty much on a daily basis. and. You know, some of these uh, things were just kind of a refresher for me. And uh, again, some of the numbers that you're mentioning, it's it's quite remarkable. Uh, you know, with 8,000 members, I believe you said, and 2,000 volunteers. Um, one quick question that I have, and, and I should probably know this myself, but it's been maybe a few years. I know that to become a coach on PEI, you have to have a criminal record check. Uh, you also have to take a respect in sport uh, program. It's, a, it's an online uh, component. I'm curious, uh, Connor, if you would know, because this is something that's also suggested out to uh, not only the coaches or the staff, but it's also uh, recommended for the parents. 
if you would have any numbers on the uptake of actually the number of people that complete that, whether it be the coaching staff or if it's the uh, parents, uh, if, you, if you'd have any number on that, Connor. Just so, Connor, before you uh, answer that, could you, uh, if you could, just take a second to maybe uh, turn your screen share off? Oh, perfect. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Did you get that question, Connor? Yeah, I, I have it, Mr. Bell. Thank you. So I, I'm going to answer it. Um, and if it's not to your satisfaction, I'll, I'll circle back. So um, to answer your question, every coach uh, and parent has to take the respect in sports certification once. Um, there's no recertification process for that. Um, so, so that is taken in every year. Um, our officials are recertified every year. Um, within their recertification, there's a module on uh, not only Rule 11, but on, on ED&I training. Um, we're also kind of right now looking at, uh, sorry, and the coaches um, clinics that Chris does, um, starting this year, there's also a module added into ED&I very similar to um, the officials component, um, except more geared towards coaches. Um, so in saying that, um, yes, those are in place, but I'm more than comfortable to say that um, the Hockey BI Board of Directors doesn't feel as though that education is enough. Um, we're currently undergoing review, consultation, um, trying to find additional um, educational tools that we can implement here on PEI going forward. Um, so yeah, we, we do have some of that stuff in place, but I think, you know, the, the public statement that Hockey PEI put out on uh, the end of December was more or less saying that, yeah, we recognize we have some of that stuff in place, but boots on the ground, it's, it's, it's not enough. And we're going to continue to look to um, develop some, some better educational tools that may be, hit some of those important players in the game that you mentioned, parents, officials, coaches, um, and hit some on a more regular basis as well. Zach? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Connor. Yeah, and I, I appreciate, again, you, you coming in. I know this is uh, probably not what you were expecting to be doing. Um, you know, you've got a lot of, uh, and again, I, I didn't understand the, the amount of time and effort that goes into everything. And I do just kind of want to reiterate that with uh, the fact that, um, you know, because again, hockey is such a sport, um, and it's funny when you were going through some of the uh, points you were making in your presentation, you know, as a coach, I'm thinking back and I'm like, because I've been coaching hockey now for 20 plus years and saying, oh my goodness, you know, maybe I did yell at a referee too loud one time and, you know, I kind of want to check myself. But, and again, you know, having two small children that play hockey now, a lot of that comes from the point of view of, you know, we're trying to create our children to be, you know, very inclusive and very responsible respectful of not only the officials, but of the coaches and the coaching staff. So I, I do think, and as you had mentioned to Michelle's question where, you know, the, uh, f uh, the social media policy is getting that update, um, I'm wondering if that is something, I know respect in sport is something that comes from the national body, if that's something that might be maybe looked at as an update as well to include some different uh, things that parents, players and coaches can all maybe learn from. Yes, you're, you're bang on. Um, so, so that is a national program um, that comes from Hockey Canada with their, with their partnership with Safe Sport. Um, I, I can say that that um, is currently being reviewed internally at Hockey Canada. When I say internally reviewed at Hockey Canada, that means that they are reaching out to members um, like Hockey PEI to get their opinion on that type of programming. Um, and, and the feedback that you've given today is, is often the feedback that we get from people that have boots on the ground. Um, so yes, those, those educational tools are, are under review at this point. Um, those, those educational tools are a little bit harder for us to, to completely curtail to what the needs are of, of Islanders and, and Islanders that play hockey because they are a national program. It's my hope that those programs are, are tweaked to the point where, like you said, it, it promotes a more inclusive environment. Um, I will say that Hockey PEI is not going to put all of our eggs in the basket where um, we're hoping the national program for, for respect and sport takes care of the educational requirements that our membership needs. So I think what you're going to see next year um, it's probably a mixed match and a combination of, of all of the above. So I think you're going to see um, 
a revamp of, of the national programs. Um, and I think you'll see an implementation of um, some different educational ideas and tools that uh, Hockey PI is going to implement as well. Zach? Thank you, Chair. Just one more, maybe just a comment on that. And I do think that is important as well um, to, you know, kind of put that PEI touch to it because, again, you know, being regulated by the national body um, last year, you know, the PEI and Islanders were very happy to have provincials where some of the other provinces weren't able to have uh, provincials. So that's just more of a comment um, to have that PEI touch to it. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Connor. Thank you. Uh, Sydney? Thank you, Chair, and, and thanks so much, uh, Connor, for uh, being here today and preparing uh, the presentation. Um, a, a couple of things, but I guess one, can you walk us through what exactly happened with the social media uh, policy and the, and the recent event that, that occurred um, as far as seeing what happened and then the, the decision to implement the, the policy the, the way it was? Can you walk us through like what that looked like as far as which group dealt with it and, and, uh, and then you know, who made the decision to, to do it? And I ask that so that we can, as you say, learn from it and then figure out how to go forward with a new social media policy. Sure. Um, I'm just wondering, could we go in camera for this? I, I would like to provide uh, a level of detail to the committee that uh, I think the committee deserves a level of detail. And I would really like to speak in camera um, about that, that policy and what happened um, to paint the picture for the committee because I think the narrative that is in the public is not quite true. Um, it, it doesn't mean that we weren't, we made a mistake. That's quite clear. Um, but if we could go in camera, maybe have a really open discussion about that. I think it might be some benefit for the committee in that. Um, but I'll leave that with the committee, I guess. Well, the request is being made by guests. So I'll check it over with the committee, um, uh, to talk about that. Sydney. Uh, thanks. Um, Thank you, Connor. I struggle with that, like because I, I want the public to know exactly what happened, and uh, um, there are times when we go in, in committee to discuss uh, situations because there's a certain impact on, on someone that we don't want to have, you know, uh, uh, repercussions. But I, I I would prefer to talk about this publicly as much as we can. I think it's <coughs> to to get an understanding. There's nothing wrong with admitting mistake, and, and hockey PEI has done that. But I would prefer to know as much as I, as I can on, on the on the record. Now I don't know what everybody else thinks, but I do think too, Mr. McEwen, that um, some of our volunteers have gone through, uh, a, and not to make them a victim in this, um, but I work for a board of directors, and and the instruction uh, it's it's and it has nothing to do with hiding so I, I don't mind and we can talk publicly about it i just think for the committee's benefit um if we went in camera for a minute i think i could paint a picture that would um explain kind of what happened um it, it won't justify the mistake that was made but i think it will paint the picture for you um if you don't want to go in camera it's no problem i can i can start talking right now about it that that's fine uh, it's totally up to you I'm just checking with the committee. It's the committee's will, I guess. Um, we've uh, heard, uh, I think um, it's probably best at this point, uh, Connor, that you we stay uh, public and um, it's up to you to, uh, to deliver the information or answer the question as you see fit. Sure. So Mr. McEwen, I'm sorry, would you mind asking the question again so I can make sure I answer it properly? Uh, Sydney's. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks, Connor. And, and uh, like I, again, to reiterate, I think this is important for 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 Hockey PEI to ex explain what happened as well. So I, I appreciate your your willingness to uh, to stay on the record here. So basically, uh, I'm I'm curious to know, you know, the in in regards to the social media policy, how that gets re how that got reported to Hockey PEI, and then what actions uh, took place. In order to to give the discipline that that uh, that happened, you know, the, the step by step, like this is how it got reported to us. It went to whatever group or whatever committee or uh, we to to implement, and then the decision was made to to give out the uh, the uh, the su suspension based on the current policy. And I ask this because I think it's important in order to know 
how to get to a new, better social media policy to understand the current process that, that happened in, in this situation. Yeah, no, no problem. So as the committee can probably appreciate, PEI is a very small place. So anytime uh, a rather large um, issue is brought to social media, it's kind of reported to us in a hundred different ways for lack of better terms. Um, so when those decisions come in, um, just like on my slide, I showed the, the complaint intake form, um, same idea. So um, the opposing team of the player um, filed the complaint intake form based on the social media post. Um, so we had two members that were um, at odds with each other, I guess, on, on two different sides of the fence. Um, that came into the Discipline and Ethics Committee that was dealing with the issue at the time. Um, that committee politely reached out to the team and the player to um, possibly take down the post. There was threat of legal action at the time um, from one of our members to the other member. Um, and when the post was refused to be taken down, that's when the suspension was issued. Um, not saying it's right, uh, it's certainly wrong. Um, it, it's awful unfair for me to speak about the intention of of that committee and when the decision was made because I don't sit on the committee and I don't make the decision. Um, I do know that when I saw the original post, um, there was a reference to a report of racism to a referee and, an, and then a, a referee laughing about it. Um, I would assume uh, without asking the committee that that factored into their decision as well. Um, they probably felt that that looked like hockey PEI didn't take racism seriously. And they probably didn't think all the way through um, what would happen if the suspension was issued. Thank you, Connor. Sydney? Thank you, and th thank you, Connor, and, and clearly, clearly not. Um, the, so going forward, when you say, you know, the changes obviously have to be made to the social media to policy, so uh, how do you see that process going forward, and how can Hockey PEI uh, members like our, our, ourselves uh, you know, provide input into that? Like, how, what, what, what triggers this? Who is going to go forward with it so that we have something in place, you know, it, it, correctly and as soon as possible? Careful, Sydney. You, you sound like you're volunteering for a position. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it, 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 so, sure. so to, to, to answer, answer your question, uh, sorry, and I'm sorry, Connor, that's a joke. Uh, um, but to answer your just question, just we currently it. have, have a committee that's uh, reviewing our policies. That committee was struck in August. Um, obviously a lot's changed and we've learned a lot since August. So the process that we've kind of implemented right now is to reach out into the community to see if there's anyone out there who has direct experience uh, professionally, personally dealing with such an issue. Um, we've also reached out to our national organization, Hockey Canada, to see what other members within the country is doing. Uh, we're trying to collect back best practices to see if there's a policy out there. Um, I think the social media policy for Hockey PEI kind of runs parallel to the social media policy that a lot of, of institutions like UPEI would have, uh, Hall and College, uh, different educational institutions. Um, and to answer your question about how to get involved, um, once we are able to work our way through um, two cases that we currently have, um, once we're able to work our way through that, that's when the review um, is really going to ramp up for our rules and regulation. And at some point, we're going to have a call um, for volunteers, whether that's uh, public on social media, whether that's collecting names and circulating it. Um, one issue we do have at Hockey PEI, and I'm kind of hoping that, you know, there's been some horrible things happen to some hockey players here this winter, but if there's a, and I don't know if silver lining is the right word, but if, if there's something good to happen out of a horrible situation, I really hope that you know, maybe we'll have an uptake in, in professional people that have experiences with such things that will jump on board and help hockey PEI with this stuff. Um, I think there's been some of that already. We, we, we do have people that have joined us uh, or our, our organization since this all hit the news. Um, so I'm kind of hoping that, that the seriousness, the, the kind of the spotlight that's been shined on this will, will attract qualified people to our organization to help us sort through those policies. Sydney? Thank you, uh, Connor, and, and I appreciate that. And, and uh, I, I want to make reference to your, I, I know you're, you're joking around about careful uh, what you wish for, you'll get a, a job with Hockey PEI, but it was interesting when this was was exploding in, in a real negative way for, for uh, us in the community and as PEI in, in general, 
you know, like a, as, a, as a, a, a public figure, like, you know, it's easy for me to say this is Hockey PEI's problem, but, you know, it was pointed out to me um, uh, by someone close to me, like, that, you know, I am a member of Hockey PEI. I, I am a part of that organization. You talked about it at the first. There's 8,000 of us that are involved. You know, like, it's, it is a huge group. And, you know, if, if, uh, if uh, when you joke about having a job, I feel like I do have a job because I'm part of it. And if I'm not going into the dressing room and, and speaking to the kids about this incident so they're aware of what happens, like, you know, we talk about racism and we, we talk about, you know, like, and, and homophobia and not doing those things. But if I don't make, you know, Use this as an example to 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 you know uh, amplify the message. I mean, it, I I am a member, and it is up to me to you know like a, I feel like it is my job to 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 do that. Um, uh, you know, like a, a Zach had talked about the training that we get as coaches and and all that kind of stuff, and there was no doubt something said about that way back when. But do you know what I mean? It is a reminder to continuously that we need to remind people of it. We need to use these awful, awful examples as learning moments and, and, and teach them better kind of thing. So I, I, I'm glad you, you, you did kind of make that point because uh, it was in my mind. I'm like, well, this, this, you know, I'm sure there's people out there that thought, well, this isn't my problem. This is Hockey PEI's problem. But no, really, it is all our problem. We all need to, to, to work towards it kind of thing. So um, I'm, uh, that's good for, for, for right now for me, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, Michelle? Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, so I just want to go back, um, Connor, to the maltreatment um, rule. And when you read through it, I have to say the very first thing I thought was it's not even plain language, right? There's, it's not written for the everyday person for your 8,000 members. If you read through that, you have to read into it in order to understand, I think, or at least for me, and I've read a lot of policies and that kind of thing. Um, so if it's not plain language, like what really kind of st stuck out for me is you don't even name it. You don't name it as racism. We don't name it as bigotry. We don't name it as homophobia. It's not named. It's just a lot of big academic words that I wonder, does your membership even understand it? So I, I guess my question to you is, is have you even tested the rule for understanding with your membership? Great question, Michelle. I think, so just, just to back it up to be clear, so th this was produced by Hockey Canada and the national uh, governing body. So you're right, it, it was produced by lawyers with lawyers on lawyers. So when you read it, it it reads like a legal convoluted document. Um, what I will say is that the development of this document was, it was meant to be a living, breathing document. I think within the game of hockey, um, not just Hockey Canada, but within the game of hockey, um, you see some things that are happening at the pro level and different stuff like that. I think Hockey Canada, Hockey PEI realized that there needed to be something in place um, so they kind of undertook a huge process to put this in place. Um, I don't think that process is perfect, um, to your point. I, I don't know. And this is something that we deal with on an almost everyday basis. And, and I'm not comparing, um, you know, maltreatment, racism, bigotry, homophobia. I'm not comparing any of that to a skating program. But just in terms of how Hockey Canada, Hockey PEI operates, um, you know, things that are born or, or harvested at the top of the tree, a lot of the times the, the skill is getting it all the way to the bottom. So, you know, taking a program that's developed in, in Calgary, where Hockey Canada is, and making sure that gets down to Surrey um, with every, you know, bell and whistle, everything attached to it, all the, all the proper, um, you know, spirit of, of the program to be there. That's something we struggle with. And I would agree with your take on, on the rule 11. I think it's, it's a living, breathing document that needs to transition from reading something that sounds like a lawyer wrote it to an everyday actionable item where you can point to it. I, I also think, and you didn't point this out, so, but I do, I think it's too long as well. Um, not only is it not clear, it's too long. So I'm sure the committee finds this in 2022, but I know myself running a volunteer organization, a lot of people don't read past the first or second paragraph. And that's just 
a reality of where we are today. So excellent points. I agree with you. I don't necessarily have an answer today because that's a national policy, but I do know that the spirit of the policy is that it's going to be a living, breathing document. And I do know that with all of the incidents that have happened here this year, that there's a national appetite to fix it quickly. Michelle. Great. Okay. And I appreciate that. And I will rem from what I read, Hockey PEI is also a member of that national organization and should have input into what policies and verbiage comes down to your membership to ensure that, you know, you just don't take it from national because it's also important to look at, like you said, who wrote it and was there a diversity lens on, put on that? So if you were speaking to, for instance, the Black Cultural Society and you reviewed that rule with them, would they agree with the wording? And so if it's written by a population of white, you know, white people, cis people, would that translate down so that you are actually speaking to your entire membership? And if you are truly speaking about diversity and inclusion, you need to have more lenses on anything that you put out to your membership to include, to ensure that everybody in your membership sees themselves in it which means you got to name it. You got to, like, we have to put names to it. And so one of the things that came out recently was uh, tape out hate, right? That um, there was a video that came out and I forget what the organization was, but it came out similarly, like right around the time that um, all of the concern around the social media policy and people were speaking out around hockey PEI and they do name it. They say like racism, ignorance and hate have no place in hockey. But when you have large organizations like that speaking to it, it would appear to me that we all know it's there. And so just writing a policy, it's a good start. But then how do you push that out to everybody? So I, my next question would be around training. And I know that we've talked about a little bit about it, but I'm wondering what diversity inclusion training is available to all of your members and whether anything's mandatory or not have nothing mandatory at this time the board tasked myself on the end of november 1st of december board meeting to provide options for that um, for the upcoming season we're pretty far down the road um, with a partnership can't name that partnership at this time um, but we are pretty far down that road i think too it's important to highlight the video you're talking about was produced by a group called the hockey alliance out of toronto um, Carrie Adams is one of their founding members. Um, Chris and Anthony Stewart are one of their founding members. I played junior hockey with those guys. Um, and I know Carrie personally. So I've been in touch with them for quite some time. And those are the type of groups we're looking to partnership with. Those are the type of groups we are um, asking to borrow their lens to look at policies and, and education and the whole gamut. So those are the type of groups that we are trying to um, partner with. Um, I, I, it's very hard. I think my take is um, there's maltreatment, there's homophobia, we're going to name it, there's racism, there's bigotry, there's all that in hockey, but there's all that in PEI. Um, mm -hmm. These are society issues. Um, it's my opinion that the hockey culture allows for these society issues to come into the game of hockey, and we are currently evaluating um not only how do we not have it happen in hockey, but how do we actually educate the island? How do we educate our 8,000 members? Because our, our heads don't rest easy on pillows knowing we have 8,000 members out there and they can say and do whatever they feel in their heart. Um, I think when, I, when a kid, um, and I say kid because you know, 70% of our membership or so would be about elementary age, so 13, 12, 13 and under, um, those words, they don't learn them in music videos or movies, in my opinion, they learn them at the kitchen table. So how do we, how do we educate, um, ourselves, our membership to the point where, um, not only are we looking to catch incidents of racism, but we're trying to prevent incidents of racism. I think that's extremely hard. Um, we're going to try. We're really going to try. It's going to be all the things that you mentioned. It's going to be reaching out to groups with a different lens. It's going to be bringing in 
um, different people with different experiences to the board committee um, level. Um, it's going to take consultation. It's going to take dollars and cents um, from the Hockey BI board of directors. Um, and it's not an excuse, but it's a huge task. And, and, and right now we're kind of in what I would call the listening phase. Um, you know, we mentioned three or four groups that are, that are very good groups, very specific, um, that kind of have a head start in this. They've been doing it for years. They have a background in this type of, of diversity and inclusion um, type of world. They have great ideas and suggestions for us. Um, so it's just a matter of kind of building those relations um, to solve the problem as quickly as possible, but also as thoroughly and thought out as possible. I think what, and again, I'm getting a little ahead of myself talking for the board of directors for Hockey PEI, but I think it's fair to say that the board of directors want to guard against a copy and paste, check a box type of education. I think what we're looking at hopefully is not a module. Maybe it might have to be a module in the end of the day, but what we're really looking at is, is alternative views on the education process. How can we actually touch the kids? How can we affect the conversation at the kitchen table? Again, it's gonna be hard. It's gonna take some out of the box thinking. It's gonna take some dollars and cents, um, but that's kind of where we're at right now. Thanks. Michelle. Thanks, Thanks Connor. Thanks, Chair. Um, and I don't think you're in it alone, Connor. And I know that Hockey PEI is in the spotlight right now, but we've also seen this happen in soccer. We've seen this happen in other sports. And I don't necessarily see that this is something, you know, Sydney kind of touched on it. It's something that we're all responsible for. Um, and, you know, like we have um, lots of different, well, not lots, but we have um, different sporting organizations that probably should all be in on that with you. And I guess, this is just a, I'm interested in hearing what you've learned. I know January was obviously a very difficult month for hockey PEI. It is a challenge when you are up against, you know, um, that kind of outpouring of support and outcry. And I can imagine that you were under intense pressure. Um, but I would like to know what advice you would give other associations that see themselves in a situation where they are dealing with um, a racist um, situation or some sort of ra um, other type of situation. What is your advice for all those other organizations that you have learned through this process? Because I can imagine it hasn't been easy. So if, if we're talking about a short term complaint comes in what what an organization should do i think it's for me it's 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 quite clear um anything that deals with homophobia racism any of those topics needs to be dealt with immediately um it needs to go to the top of the organization's um uh, prioritized list we did do that at hockey pei um i think the other thing that i've learned is that these decisions, and you framed it very well earlier, these decisions need to involve people in the process that have different lenses that can look through the lens of a victim, um, uh, somebody who's experienced uh, racism, homophobia, bigotry, uh, all of the above. So I think, I think those two things are important. I think that sounds, that sounds elementary in a way um, in terms of, you know, you receive a big complaint but that's really important. You have to, when an organization receives a complaint, you, you have to take it right to the top. You, you have to engage people. Um, and the other advice I would have uh, for any other PSO, NSO, anyone who's administering sport is even if your process in your mind is good and set up, you probably haven't think, thought of everything. So before you receive it, before your season or your year or however your, 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 your organization works, you should really sit down, take a week, take two weeks, take three meetings, whatever it takes, review your process. Think of every, every small hole, every, every possible stumbling block and really hammer down that process. I think for us, our process was nailed down in this, Public may not believe me on this, but I, I think our process was nailed down 99%. But guess what? 99% is not good enough. It, it has to be 100. It has to be 110. And I think that's the lesson that Hockey PEI has learned here. 
Um, and the other thing too, that, that I think all organizations are going to face and it's, it, it, I don't have an answer for this is volunteer burnout. So you have to be really careful with your volunteers, who you have doing what, when they're doing it, because for example, in hockey, when things start off, we have all of the things Sydney Zach mentioned, you know, you have referees, coaching, all that stuff's going on at the start of the year. You have games, all of a sudden the suspensions start to roll. So there's certain people in your organization that may be burnt out quite quickly. Um, and if they're in a decision-making position, um, burnt out people make mistakes. So you, you need to, you, you need to keep an eye on that. You, you need to watch everything. Um, and the most important part is you need to reach out to find people with a different lens to, to help you through the issue. Thanks, Chair. Sure. And chair, chair, just one more question or, or thought. I did watch um, uh, Tamara Steele was on Compass the other night and talking about, you know, this is Black History Month and it's important to have conversations every day, not just in this month. But I understand that your organization also spoke with the Black Cultural Society um, in around your response to this and how to move forward, which I do commend you for, because like I said, you're not going to get yourself out of a situation if you don't understand the situation in the first place. So I do commend you for doing that. One of the things that, um, you know, was in the response, um, who was the protection kind of around who, who are you protecting? And we have to always remember that we've got two people. Like whenever there's a situation, there's always two parties. And, you know, we talk a lot in um, sexual assault and sexual harassment and, and believing the victim, right? And, and um, we've gone through a very long history in sexual assault and sexual harassment cases where the victim's not always believed. And we really need to move forward um, to understanding that there's, yes, there are two sides of it, but we also have to have that lens of how do you support somebody whose rights have been taken away from them and understanding that you also have that other side, which you have to balance. But um, given the fact that we're, that you're dealing with vulnerable people, I've, I volunteer in an organization as well with young kids. We always have to be aware of who we need to protect and um, ensure that we give give that lens as well. And so um, I do, so I just wanted to say, I am glad that you reached out. You're probably not in time. <laughs> it, like hindsight, it would have probably been great to do that months and months and months, years ago, probably. Um, so I think that a, a very valuable lesson um, was learned. But one of the things that we did have Tamara Steele come into the standing committee to talk to us about, um, you know, uh, discrimination and we all have a lot of work to do and when none of us are working fast enough and i will say that the bipoc community has been patient but we're past the time of ignorance and we're past the time of moving slow because it's comfortable for us and so i think that there is a time now where we all need to realize that we do have to do the work um, because the bipoc community has done the work and they've been patient and um, we really have a lot of lessons to learn um, to move forward. So I do appreciate your candid, an candid answers and um, I appreciate you presenting to us today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Carla Bernard. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much, Connor, for being with us today. These, I really value these conversations. This is how, how change happens. And I, I'm going to kind of, I have a comment, and then I'm going to kind of actually jump off what Michelle had just, what Michelle, one of Michelle's questions. But, Cam Connor, you had mentioned about silver linings. And while you were presenting, I was thinking, what an opportunity, silver lining, this is for hockey PEI in terms of being a provincial leader on a national stage because we did get you know there was a national spotlight on on this and so you know I, I can imagine the pressure right now and the opportunity that you have right now and so there was something in when when I was reading through the maltreatment um, policy or I forget what it's called but the maltreatment policy um, I, I had the same thoughts as Michelle and and something else that that was obvious to me that popped into that popped out at me was 
the wording around the benefit and welfare of hockey. And so, you know, these things are put in place in that policy, when I read it, it makes it sound like things are put in place to protect the sport of hockey. But playing the sport of hockey are our children, our, our, you know, our brothers, our sisters, our dads, our moms, whoever. And so I would like to throw in my two cents for language and, and look at, at this being for the benefit and welfare of the players and not the sport. Um, while, of course, it's important for the sport to, to have that integrity, um, it's the individuals who play it that we need to protect. Um, so I'm just going to, from there, uh, as, as uh, Michelle had mentioned, um, Tamara Steele from Black Cultural Society was on Compass, and she was in to present to us. And I was re-watching that committee with the lens of this meeting on my mind. And so one of the things that Tamara talked about was, was uh, race-based data collection. And I'm just wondering if, if this incident has spurred any conversations or any actions around gathering information from the players themselves around, you know, the, the culture in hockey and, and if they notice things and if there's anything that makes them feel othered um, in the sport. And to, in order to get, you kind of talked about boots on the ground and you can't get more boots on the ground than the player. So I'm wondering if there's been any attempt at kind of whether it be, I don't know, a survey or coaches talking to players or however that would look. I'm just wondering if there's been any outreach to talk to players. Um, n not a wide casting reach out to talk to players. I, I think it's important to remember that our players for the most part are under the age of 13. So you're, you're dealing with elementary school kids. Now, I, I'm not saying that, that your point's invalid because they're young, but I'm saying typically we don't survey the kids we typically survey the parents um again i think that falls under the what has hockey pei learned in the last two months i think that is um a major qu uh, question i think to your statement you're, you're kind of all around um something that hockey deals with on a general basis and I i'm not talking about maltreatment i'm just talking about typical day-to-day -day business and and that is who is the customer of Hockey Canada? Who is the customer of Hockey PEI, right? Is it is it the participant and the kid? Is it the parent? Um, how do you survey? You know, can can you can you survey a, a parent and and know that the information you're getting is accurate, or is the information coming back seen through a lens of a parent who paid a lot of money to play hockey and isn't happy with the ice time? Um, that's not racial issues. That's just on a day to day kind of basis that we deal with. I think right now um, at the national level, and I can say this with confidence, at the national level, at our level, we're trying to figure out just that. How do we connect better with the kids? How do we connect better with the players? How do we connect better with the coaches? Um, and how do we educate uh, all along that process? So I think, I think we're very much uh, all around this issue and it's something that we've chewed on at a national provincial level um, but to answer your question, we haven't reached out to a wide variety of, of players to ask their opinion. We've reached out to a few players that um, have either been victimized, um, people that we know uh, on a personal level, maybe. Um, we've reached out to some of those players in the game. Um, but no, we haven't done a wide reaching survey of, of our membership. Carla? Thank you, Chair, and thank you for that, Connor. And uh, having having been a teacher of grade one, I would say I would love to hear what the kids would have to say. And I I, I think that that would be a really, I, I know that, you know, when you're playing hockey, limited ice time and all that, but at the same time, I think that those would be really interesting conversations and in terms of helping you grow as an organization, given, you know, given the spotlight that that is on in PEI right now. Um, my next question, my notes are a bit all over the place here. Um, so one of the other things we talked about was how um, the population is growing and diversifying and, and how do you, how do you um, identify barriers and how do you work towards getting rid of those barriers, barriers so that you know, newcomers want to keep coming to PEI? And so again, I put a lens on this, a hockey PEI lens on this, and I was thinking about how if we want to grow the sport, and if it is going to be reflective of the population in PEI, it's going to become even more and more diverse. Um, and we want we we must ensure that that it's safe. And and I don't think 
that we can knowingly ensure that, you know, hockey is safe right now. You could say that about any sport, right? There's always going to be a bit, not just sports, but there's always going to be a bit of a risk there. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, um, one of the things that's loud is in clear is that without representation, there's not going to be any more movement, you know, the growth kind of stops. So I'm wondering, you had kind of mentioned this earlier, but I'd just love to dig in a little bit deeper about what hockey PEI's conversations look like around growing the diversity to include more um, diversification of boards, of committees, officiating, um, referees, coaches into the sport so that there is more representation and that children can see themselves reflected at some level, at least in hockey PEI. Yeah, so we've are we've already undertaken that process. Um, I did mention earlier we've we've added people um, to our board that see the world through that lens. Um, you know, I think it's important, and this would also fall under the category of what has hockey PEI learned in the last couple of months. Um, you know, I think when we reached out to those people and and asked them to join our team and and stuff like that, a lot of those people saw the value in it um, and joined us, which was great. Um, but their fear is that they're presented in a way that undermines their position. And some of those people have asked for the time being, uh, due, due to the climate of the news and so, and such that we don't announce them at this time. So we're kind of a bit of a rock and a hard place where we we've reached out to groups, individuals, organizations to make alliances. And most of those groups have just asked us not to speak about it at this point. You talk about the Black Cultural Society. Um, there's another number of groups that we have reached out to um, with varying degrees of success. So I think, you know, I, I think that's that's a tough spot. I think right now we're, we're, we're into a position where some of the stuff that we have in place, it would be great if we could announce it publicly, but the people that are in those positions don't feel comfortable in doing so yet. So we're into a bit of a, a washing cycle for lack of better terms, but we have started those conversations. We have gone down the road. We have added new personnel. Um, the board is committed to diversifying the board. I think in Maritimes in general, PEI in general, I think the last 10 years of diversity, you know, people think female, um, they, th they think through the female lens. I think that's fair to say at the hockey PEI board as well. Um, but we're looking now to further diversify to all your points to, to be more welcoming, um, to add people to different committees that are dealing with, with a racial issue, um, you know, to, to add all of those things to our, to our organization. And we have added some of them. There's just some of them that those people who have joined us has asked us not to make it public. So it, it's a bit of a rock and a hard place, but we're a little farther along in those conversations than the public may realize. And, and that's the reason why. Carla. Thank you, chair. And thank you for that, Connor. And, and I guess my last, the last thing I'll say right now is more of a, of a comment, but, um, you, when we were talking earlier about, uh, sitting around the dinner table and Connor, what, a you have, you know, I know you're hockey PEI, you're, you're, a sport and you're dealing with this and it's definitely these things are happening in our society they're not unique you know to to any certain organization you just happen to be you know the the one that's here right now and so um what a unique position that hockey pei is in i know this is this you know this has been horrible but i i do like to look for silver linings and i think about the opportunity that you have right now because people are sitting around the dinner tables talking you know and they they want to talk you know, if we're around our kitchen table growing up and now with my son, like we talk about hockey sometimes and you have an opportunity to take our, if I'm speaking about the children in particular at this time, children and youth, you know, they're a system on their a system as part of their family. And so they're going to take what they learn from hockey and, and take it and share it around the, the, the dinner table. So you have an opportunity to change those dinner table conversations. And so I, I really look forward to hearing more. I know it sounds like there's some stuff coming that you're not allowed to talk about right now. So um, thank you for, for taking that on. 
and I hope that when you are able to speak to it, you shout it from the rooftops and, you know, hockey PEI does not stand for racism and, and to be national leaders. And I think that that's a, a pretty cool opportunity out of a, a not so great situation. Thanks, Connor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rob Henderson. Thanks, Connor. Uh, appreciate your presentation here today. And I guess, as you know, we're, I represent a riding in O'Leary. And if there's two things that are very passionate in O'Leary, it's uh, potatoes and hockey. So, <laughs> so it's always uh, good to uh, have a discussion around the subject. But I want to try to get a little bit more of a sense of uh, sort of the, the organizational hierarchy here when it comes to implementing a policy or, or a rule or regulation. So you have Hockey Canada, then Hockey PEI, and then you have the 20 minor hockey associations under that. So. So when Hockey Canada develops, say, a policy around social media uh, information or how that's presented, and Hockey PEI then takes a look at that and it implements a policy, and you'd mentioned that it was probably about eight years ago when you implemented a policy around social media, which, as I see social media, it seems to change very rapidly, and there's so many different formats, it would seem to me that uh, that, that was a gap that was left there. But, when it gets down to the association level, so if I take the O'Leary Minor Hockey Association or Tyne Valley Minor Hockey Association, uh, what leeway does each of these levels have in uh, uh, strengthening, say, a particular policy? So if it was a social media policy, I'll just use that one as an example. If Hockey Canada has a rule, can Hockey PEI add to that or strengthen it a bit as long as it still complies with uh, uh, Hockey Canada's uh, outline or mandate? And can a minor hockey association like O'Leary or Tyne Valley, can they strengthen that a bit more or put a bit more of a, their own spin on it as long as, as it's approved by, say, Hockey PEI, the one above them? It's kind of like the Charter of Rights as it goes down to a provincial legislature and the rules that we have to implement as it pertains to at least it has to comply with the, say, Charter of Rights. So just maybe give me a better sense or explanation on uh, what leeway uh, flexibility associations have to implement policy. Yeah, so the really quick answer is that you can strengthen the policy as it goes down the chain, but you can't weaken it. So if Hockey PEI gets a policy from Hockey Canada and needs to be implemented you know, on, on the nuts and bolts basis of it, um, the same relationship exists between Hockey PEI and the members. So if we send something down the chain, first of all, the members all have an opportunity to vote on it and provide feedback. Um, but if there's a certain policy, and I can't think of a great example right now, but if, if there is a perfect policy that would be implemented kind of different in Surrey than it would be in Tignish, um, those associations have the ability to amend that as long as it's, it's stronger than what Hockey PEI has. They're not allowed to take um, out of the policy. Um, I think too with Hockey Canada, um, there's kind of two, two forms of how policies come down from Hockey Canada. Number one is the full kind of member process where it's debated and chewed on. Um, there's a number of, of points throughout the year where feedback is solicited from the membership and a policy is developed that way. I think there's also a, a second avenue where policies are developed within the game of hockey where it's kind of initiated at the provincial level or the member level. Um, that feedback kind of goes up the chain to the national organization. The national organization realizes that, you know, whatever specific policy we're talking about is a bit more regional in nature or, or provincial in nature. Um, so they kind of turn it back to the 14 members to kind of make their own policies under one umbrella. So th that's kind of two ways that we receive policies. The, the, the maltreatment policy, that was one that went through the full process, the, me the member engagement process, top to bottom, um, and was done right. Something like um, uh, locker room boxing policy, that may be specific to the region. Um, you know, maybe there's a bit of a culture in Atlanta, Canada, where locker boxing is still going on. And in BC, maybe they don't have any issue with locker boxing. So th those policies can all be amended. If you get a big one down from, from Hockey Canada, it can only be strengthened at the provincial level. Um, and any association that either receives a Hockey PEI or a Hockey Canada uh, policy, they have the ability to strengthen it as well. Rob? 
Does that happen often? No, not if I use social media or discrimination. I mean, are there examples where uh, a minor hockey association may be added to it uh, yeah, at a, you know, from, uh, from a, say, a social media policy perspective? And I, I kind of will say it tongue in cheek, but I mean, if, when you mention the boxing, I'm thinking O'Leary and Tig Nish. We always seem to have a pretty good rivalry going on. Maybe they'd be try, out trying to uh, do one another. But, uh, but just to give a bit of a sense, does, does it happen often or is it really top driven down? It's top driven down, Robert. And what I mean by that is it, it, there's opportunity to solicit information, but a lot of times it doesn't come back from the minor hockey associations. I think people need to, like the, re, the real people that conduct hockey are, are the minor hockey associations and they deal with the daily complaints of the parents, which anyone who's been involved with hockey, um, there's a saying out there, crazy hockey parent. I'm not aware of a crazy basketball parent saying or a crazy volleyball parent saying. So it is a bit unique to our sport. I think what happens a lot of the time, and I don't think it's calculated, but what happens a lot of the time is these volunteers are so exhausted, filling so many roles at the same time that, you know, when it comes time for feedback in April, May, or June about a policy, maybe they're off their emails because they've been dealing with, with, uh, a really long headache over the entire season or maybe you have um, a particular association that's has uh, infighting at the board level or you have an association that's in between memberships or whatever may be the case I think that flow up and down um, is good and, and the process is there but how often MHAs engage how often volunteers engage is kind of depending on the situation, depending on the time of year. And I don't think that we necessarily get all the feedback that, that we could use on a day-to-day -day basis, like the, the boots on the ground stuff. And I think it's because a lot of the minor hockey associations are, they face volunteer burnout, lack of volunteers, people filling multiple positions. And because of that, I think they don't spend a lot of time on the policy. And that's just, there's no, um, real reason for that other than I think they're they're very burnt out and they give a lot of hours in the rink trying to actually get the kids on the ice. And I appreciate that and I, I really as a former minor hockey parent and coach and all those different uh, hats that I've worn over the years uh, uh, I certainly can understand that and policy is not something that really uh, motivates a lot of uh, volunteers anyway but, but I guess I just wanted to make make note that if there were uh, an association or uh, that wanted to uh, implement a, a stronger policy than what uh, maybe the hockey PEI or hockey Canada had, they do have that ability to try to do that, I guess, and, and I'll, I'll leave it up to them to decide what the appropriate action would be from there. So thanks very much, Chair. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I have a few questions, if that's all right. Um, um, just for the record, too, uh, Hockey PEI never contacted the Black Cultural Society. Um, that's that's a fact. It's, it has not been done. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, what would you say uh, to people that said with the with the um, Mark Connors thing that Hockey PEI has stalled the process, uh, insulated themselves, and it's taking way too long? Um, I would say that a complaint was received by Hockey PEI. Um, we quickly realized that the scope of the investigation was outside of our um, realm of, of being able to develop to develop a, a, a timeline for Mark. I think anytime you you deal with um, a professional process that may involve lawyers investigations, it takes time. Um, the community we struck is also taking time. I think um, it would be nice to be able to provide a service for our membership where we could do a thorough, quick job. Um, but sometimes I think thorough and quick is a bit of an oxymoron. I think our board um, immediately felt Mark was credible and immediately felt that um, we needed to do something um, to initiate a process to, to provide him with an answer. Um, and that has taken some time, um, no question. Um, but I think once the decision is rendered and people get a look at what, what's what been done, um, I, I think they'll understand that it's been a thorough process. 
I asked the question to you on December 14th when I did come in to speak to you with members of the BIPOC community. I asked you when was this report going to be done? And the answer was no later than the Christmas break. At that time, there was no lawyer. There was no uh, other uh, ad hoc disciplinary committee. When did the when did the process change? So which process? The report? Yeah. Um, the information that you gave uh, the group that was in front of you was that it was going to be done. Your president said it was going to be done no later than the Christmas break. So we're waiting for that report. And then before you know it, we're looking in the media now. There's, uh, you know, there's there's other processes. There's ad hoc committees. Like when did the, it, it seemed like it was policy potentially on the fly. Um, just talk me through that process. Like that wasn't the information that was given at that time. Well, I'm a little confused, Gord. The, the, the process, the report is from a third party investigator. So the third party investigator needed to conduct interviews in Halifax and Charlottetown and in other areas of Prince Edward Island. He finished that report. I, I can't remember if it was the day we met with, with your group, um, the BIPOC group, or if it was a day or two before that. At that time, the investigator told us that he had hoped um, he would have the report done by Christmas. The report he developed was uh, took a little bit longer than that. Um, we didn't receive it until until the new year. Um, the plan was never to um, receive that report and have some sort of alternative process. What happened was we received the report. Um, once we received that report, there were, there was individuals identified, and ten minutes after we got the report, those individuals were suspended um, indefinitely pending a hearing. Um, their hearing was conducted by, by a committee. I think what we learned over the last two months, um, and it, it comes back to some of the points we made today, uh, mainly by Michelle, is that we needed to make sure we had different lenses in that room um, to hear those hearings. Um, and we did that. So it, it took some time to put together a committee of, of five um, to hire a chair to, to run that committee, uh, to get the committee up to date on what their what the process is um, to take feedback from from legal counsel in terms of what that process should look like and then to produce it so um, I, I don't think there was a shift in, in what we were doing um, we certainly um, you know the, the the discipline and ethics committee makes an independent decision so their ruling on what the third party investigator provided it's going to take some time I guess I guess in there you, you would talk to them about being part of the process um, and, and helping out and there was there was a joy and excitement around that until it, it would appear that Hockey PEI was potentially putting them in a situation that they had to make a ruling on something that could come back and be detrimental to them as a community, the marginalized community. Would you say that was accurate or was that a, was that a fault of Hockey PEI or did you make a mistake um, determining that? I don't think I understand the question, Gord. Yeah. You, how many people on that committee are marginalized or racialized people or that looked at your report? Uh, two. Did anybody back out? Yeah, two. And what were the, what were the reason those two people backed out? Um, I got conflicting reports. So they told the chair one issue and they told me a different issue. So I'm not sure. And I don't feel comfortable to talk about that because I don't feel as though it's fair to those two members that dropped out. What I'm saying to you is that when you bring marginalized people to the center, everyone benefits. When you use marginalized people to, to, to solve a problem, it hurts everybody. And this might have been the situation where there was problems and there was mistakes along this, along this path. And I'm, I'm sitting here, I didn't want to go down this kind of discussion, but we have to talk about this. And I'm going to give you something constructive to, to think about when, when I'm done talking about this. But there was problems along the way here and I'm just wanting to know what what you, you got yourself into a reactive situation 
What are the proactive steps that Hockey PEI plans to get out of this situation so we can move forward with education, inclusion, and, and, and dealing and solving this issue? Well, I think I've already touched on those. We're, we're currently in the listening phase. I've been tasked by the board to, to look at some alternative education um, to get the discussion down to, to the kitchen table. Um, that's really what we're looking at. Um, currently, as you mentioned, we have a, a few um, ongoing things that require a lot of attention, Mark Connor's case being one. Um, me being present here today is another one. Um, so we're, we're trying to work through all that. We're not there yet. Um, we, we don't have the education identified, but we do have groups and people and organizations identified that we're gonna partnership with. Um, we have some people identified that are gonna provide training. We have some people identified that are gonna provide um, education um, but outside of that, I'm not sure how else to answer your question. It's just the longer this, this goes on and I mean, the, the, the less we can move towards those things. And you, the, it's, it's just, when you talk about it being a huge task and that you're in the listening phase and the solving phase, I wanted you in the standing committee to, to re rejoice about the steps we were going to take moving forward. And, and we're, I feel like we're stuck. I mean, um, provincially I've made some, uh, I've given the Premier some suggestions um, about what we need to do. Um, sometimes he gets stuck on the reactive phase here, but the, the thing is when you talk about huge tasks and listening phase and, and solving the problem, this isn't a problem. When you're black, you're black. You have to live with that. You have to be part of that position. You have to be part of the solution coming forward. And I don't want to look at it as a huge problem. I want to look at it as a huge opportunity to move Prince Edward Island forward. And right now, Hockey PEI is at the center of that. And I look forward to helping you do that and helping you uh, mobilize the potentially the communities that can help you do that. Um, one of the ways is that, and I've talked about this before, Connor, where I'm not a huge fan of disciplining kids for racism. Like you said, it, it comes from other places. And one of the things that we have to do is, I don't, I don't know, um, potentially taking hockey PEI across the board and taking, taking the kids who, who have, whose voices have not been heard in this, and the majority of the kids in hockey PEI feel like this is a problem. And they're talking about it at the kitchen tables. I would say to you, as a piece of advice, take every single kid in Prince Edward Island um, keep them off the ice for half an hour, get them to write a letter to your board about how their, their hockey team is not, is, is going to do the best they can to be inclusive. Keep them off, write that letter and make sure that everybody participates in it because the kids have the answer to this. And if you include them, we're gonna get somewhere. And that might be a piece of advice where you don't discipline a few, there might have to be some discipline area actions, but go ask your association, go ask the kids, and I think that you'll be surprised about the answers. Would you agree with something like that? Um, yes, I'm just confused. Ask them what? That they don't agree with racism? If you think that every kid in Prince Edward Island is not talking about this, you're wrong. Those parents, the moms, the kids who are on there, and they often say, no, that's not part of our team. That's not part of who we are. Okay, and then get them to sign a contract about what their team symbolizes and what they're going and how we learn from this issue in Prince Edward Island and the kids will be the driving forces and they have the answers to this. By bringing them into it, by getting them to sign a contract instead of uh, reading uh, all the rules and regulations, let them decide, let them be the part of the solution. And that's how you include, you ask them. You ask them how we, how we, how we include more and how we diversify our leagues and how, how they're doing it. I think that you'll be surprised with the answer. Okay. Um, thanks a lot for listening to that. Uh, it's, it's a hard topic and I know that Hockey PEI, you've been in a difficult position. Um, this, is a, this, this, is a dif this is a difficult topic and I, I just want, you understand that it's not a huge task and I know that you're in the listening phase and I want to encourage 
everyone out there in in the BIPOC community who might be watching this is that we'll, we'll get together and support you but you 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 have to do this consistently and there, there needs to be some changes made to policy and procedure within your organization thanks um, anything else uh, anything else from the committee Um, just want to thank you for joining us here, uh, Connor, and uh, appreciate your time. And uh, I will uh, I'll leave it there, and um, we will we'll let you uh, uh, jump off there, and then we'll continue on with the rest of our meeting. Thanks very much. Thanks. Okay, I don't want to hit that. Any new business at this time? Can I get a motion to adjourn? Uh, Carla, thank you.